As we have participants from 70 countries, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or a good evening. We have reached yesterday morning 1300 registration, which is the maximum we could accept for this webinar. But for some of your colleagues that were not able to register and join us today, the video of this webinar will be made available for free on the LC's website and on the ELC YouTube channel. You will receive shortly the link. I am Stéphane Vidry, ELC Global's Director of Operation, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first of a series of two webinars on COVID-19 and the importance of nutrition and the immune system. Let's start with my disclosure statement. I'm a full-time employee at ILC Governance and Coordination. I have no financial disclosure regarding ILC member companies, and I am not providing any consulting services. So maybe a little bit of background, why we thought um, as a scientific organization, uh, we had to organize these two webinars. Many public health bodies have come up with public health practices important to follow to help reduce the spread of infection. Regular hand washing, avoiding touching the face with unwashed hands, avoiding close contact with sick people, social distancing, and disinfecting frequently touched objects play a critical role in minimizing the spread of illness. At the same time, as a scientific organization working on nutrition, we thought it would be interesting to look into um, how into sorry to look how to support the immune system with adequate nutrition as another important and parallel way to help reduce the risk and impact of virus infections. Ensuring adequate nutrition is an effective approach that can support a healthy immune response. Indeed, optimizing nutrient intake as a regular dietary habit is one way to build a more resilient immune system for a longer term. The objective of these two webinars are to share the most recent science, help you to understand the role of many micronutrients such as vitamin D, C, E, zinc, selenium, omega-3, microbiome, and more in relation to the immune system and viral infection. But also for some of the questions uh, we've received or will get, it should help you to navigate through myth and fake news we hear on TV or read in the press or social media. So in this first webinar, our speaker will address how the immune system works and the nutritional modulation of immune function. In next week's webinar, two other speakers will address nutrition and antiviral immunity and vitamin D and acute respiratory infections. As you see, and this is one of uh, the beauties of ELC, we'll be able to bring to you speakers from Latin America, North America, and Europe. So who more than ELC knows the value of the dialogue between different stakeholders, public and private sector experts. Therefore, we have made the choice for these two webinars to give 25 minutes to each speaker and 30 minutes to you, our audience. We know you have lots of questions we receive via your registration for more than 100 as of, uh, as of Sunday night, and we expect more during this webinar today. You can use, as you see on the screen, the chat box on the side. I would appreciate if you start your question with the initials of our two speakers, uh, uh, so we know the, to who the question is addressed to. And if your question is short and concise, so we can take more. A little bit background of ELC, very short. Uh, the International Life Sciences Institute is a global nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide science that improves human health and well being and safeguard the environment. ELC's activities focus primarily on nutrition and health promotion, food and water safety, risk science and toxicology, and sustainable agriculture and nutrition security. For example, specific topics we're addressing currently is alternative to animal testing. Uh, detection of microplastic, food system, alternative protein. As you can see from this uh, map on the screen, we have 15 country of regional ELC entities across the globe and one research foundation. Altogether, it allows us to address scientific topics from many different perspectives with world-class scientific leaders. 
A key feature of the ILC operating model is that we believe it's vitally important to engage expert scientists from multiple sectors. This multi-sector approach to tackling scientific questions ensures representation of a variety of viewpoints and helps to create robust processes for research, risk assessment, educational activities and capacity building. This convening of intellectual expertise and pooling of financial resources ensure that only quality, impactful science is pursued. ILSE's mandatory policies expressly forbid lobbying activities of any kind. Rather, ILSE advocates the use of science in making decisions that affect human and environmental health, but didn't, doesn't make policy recommendation or seek to influence legislative outcome toward a particular decision. All our governing bodies have a minimum of 50% public sector representation, and transparency is extremely important for ELC, and therefore the outcome of the work we do is published in peer-reviewed publication, whatever the results. Scientific integrity, of course, is also critical to developing South science for public good. ILSI's policies and model of pooling experts, expertise and funding helps to manage bias in scientific discovery because no single interest dominates. We know that public-private partnerships are important because diverse perspectives make research stronger. ILSI's multi-sectoral engagement and debate result in more credible science. We maintain all science should be judged on the merits of study design, methodology and validity of the conclusion regardless of funding sources. Since the end of 2019, each ILSI activities must contribute to the achievement and demonstrate a positive impact of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. We won't have time to dive into our many event activities or peer-reviewed publications, but you can find more in our 2019 annual report at ilc.org or by visiting the website of our 16 entities. Scientists from academia, government and industry are working with ILC because they share the belief that the most meaningful progress is made when multiple sectors of society work together. Many of the most renowned governmental and non-governmental organizations in the world partner with us for the same reason. We are honored by their commitment. Finally, I want to express my gratitude to ILSI Mesoamerica, North America, Europe and Southeast Asia region, who were strongly involved in the organization of this webinar. Let's welcome now our speakers. The view expressed in the following two presentations and during the panel discussion are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views of the International Life Sciences Institute. Each speaker had the total freedom to prepare her or his presentation. Without further ado, let's turn now to our first speaker. Dr. Christian Müller is an expert in the area of molecular oncology. He is the founder and CEO of Speratum, uh, where he leads a team of scientists developing novel technology to fight cancer. He obtained his PhD in molecular virology and microbiology from Baylor College of Medicine in Texas in 2011, during which time he worked for several biotechnology companies, for example, on HIV, vaccine development, and molecular vector design. His work on microRNAs has earned him numerous first place awards for outstanding research and presentation. Dr. Marin Muller of Multiple US Patent is a fellow in the Central American Leadership Initiative, part of the Aspen Institute, uh, and a member of the Scientific Ethics Committee of the Ministry of Health in Costa Rica and a founding member of the uh, sorry of uh, CR Biomed, the first biotechnology and medical device cluster in the region. So, Christian, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Let me see. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much for that uh, for that introduction, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today with you. 
Um, first, I'd like to make my own disclaimer. Um, I am a molecular virologist and microbiologist by training. Um, I'm not an immunologist, um, but I, I have tried to put together uh, a comprehensive presentation that brings uh, a little bit of analysis from all the most relevant publications regarding the virus. And hopefully I can I can give you a good background on the virus and it's the involvement of the immune system uh, with this virus. So there are multiple types of viruses, uh, thousands of viruses, and uh, there are basically it can be broken down into two types, DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Um, the virus that we're dealing with at this moment is called uh, SARS-CoV-2 and it causes the disease COVID-19, coronavirus disease, and the year in which it uh, was found. So this virus is a completely new virus. We did not know of its existence four months ago and a bit more. Um, and, uh, and so as a new virus, it has a slew of complications that come with it, mainly related to the fact that none of us um, have immunity to this virus prior to its appearance. Um, it's also a very highly contagious virus, and that makes it uh, the global threat and problem that it has become at this point in time. Um, so this is a coronavirus, and coronaviruses have long been recognized as important pathogens um, that infect the respiratory tracts of humans and companion animals. Um, there are seven coronaviruses that have been known uh, to date to invade humans. And most of them cause mild to moderate uh, symptoms. However, three of them have been highly pathogenic in human beings. Um, so the first of these highly pathogenic uh, viruses was SARS-CoV-1, which appeared in 2002 and uh, quickly faded out uh, by 2003, um, which which was great. It infected, uh, unfortunately, in, in that time, it infected 8,000 people and had a 10% mortality rate. So it was a very deadly virus um, and, uh, and spread rather easily. However, we were able to contain it. So we also learned that we can contain these types of coronaviruses. Although I always make the distinction that all viruses are different viruses and they behave rather differently, although we can make some inferences. Um, a few years later, uh, MERS appeared, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, and this virus was transferred. Uh, most of these RNA viruses are zoonotic viruses. That means they, that they transfer from animals to humans um, in a transmission event. So MERS appeared from camels. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about these other viruses. Um, latest, of course, is SARS-CoV-2 which uh, was named more for the etiology or uh, affliction that it causes rather than its similarity to SARS-CoV-1. It's only 70% similar genetically. Um, and of course, this virus is, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how contagious it is and what it causes. So these viruses have uh, prominent club-shaped projections um, that are composed of its, what's called their spike protein these little proteins that give it its name as they look like a crown on the surface of the virus, and that's where the name corona comes from. Um, they're very important in the development of immunity against the virus, and they're also very important in helping the virus to enter cells. Um, so here's a little bit of the structure of the virus. It has this nucleocapsid protein that gives it its spherical shape. On the surface, you can see the spike proteins, um, and then it has a single chain um, RNA molecule, which basically encodes instructions to produce more virus. And uh, very interesting of this specific family of virus um, called uh, nidoviralis, um, these viruses will break up this RNA into smaller pieces and then use that to make the rest of the components of the virus um, and one more copy of, of the RNA. Um, once the virus is produced inside a host cell, it has to leave the cell, and when it does that, it has certain implications. So how does the virus enter a host cell? Well, it uses these spike proteins, um, which fit into a human re cell receptor called ACE2 or ACE2, 
these receptors uh, work sort of like a, a lock into which the spike protein acts like a key and fits fits pretty well within this receptor not perfectly um, which i'll talk about in a second but it does fit rather well and that allows it to be internalized into the cell bringing the virus inside and causing the viral rna to be released um, so these uh, these spike proteins are are very very important for the virus. They're also the parts that uh, we we generate immunity to most strongly of the virus. Um, so they're they're very important. When the virus enters a cell and then uh, produces more virus, and these viruses leave the cell, they take with them a piece of the cell membrane. Now that that piece of the cell membrane that wraps the virus is called the envelope and it gives the virus stability. Um, and very critically, these uh, membranes are made of lipids or fats. And this is what gives us an advantage against the virus because technically what gives it stability is pretty fragile. And if we use soap and water or alcohol or detergents, we can destroy that, those lipids and therefore disassemble the virus. Um, so a lot of people have asked me if the virus was created in a laboratory. Um, and we can safely say that the virus is natural with all the evidence that we know to this point. Um, how do we know that it's natural? Well, first of all, we see that um, that whenever we make things in a laboratory, we always use certain tools that are avail available to us in molecular biology, which involve enzymes called restriction enzymes, which are like molecular scissors, and ligases, which is like molecular glue. And so we basically can put things together, but then we have to use these restriction enzymes and ligases to put them, put them back into place. And so we would see these sort of molecular scars in the virus genome if it had been constructed. But on top of that, as I mentioned before, most of these uh, RNA viruses that, that appear tend to be zoonotic in nature. That means that they transfer from an animal to a human being or through various animals and then into a human being. So uh, the first SARS-CoV virus, SARS-CoV-1, was originated in civets, these little animals, and apparently also made it a way, its way through raccoon dogs at some point. Um, this current virus has fragments of uh, genetic information from bats, which tend to be reservoirs for, for viruses. Um, it also has bits of information from a pangolin virus, um, uh, so we, we assume that it has come from those, uh, through those two animals to reach humans. Here's a paper that was published in Nature, a very respectable scientific journal, where they analyzed um, the genome of the virus, which by the way, we obtained the first genome of the virus within a month of its existence, which is an incredibly fast pace at which information is being shared across the world um, during this pandemic, which is uh, really and truly a fantastic endeavor. Um, and so we've been able to start making medications and developing vaccines based on those sequences that we've had for a while now. So as you can see on the bottom left corner here, uh, we, can, we have these different bits of recognizable um, genetic material from either pangolins or bats. Um, and this was another interesting point of when I was speaking about the spike uh, proteins being able to, to capture into the receptor. In this same paper, they also found that the affinity or the way that this spike fits into the receptor is not perfect. Um, it, it actually shows that it has evolved um, over time and manages now to fit into the human receptors. Um, so what makes this virus so complicated? Um, and I think what, what makes it this complicated is the fact that it's a pretty contagious virus. Um, so when we speak about the contagiousness of a virus or how easy it is to spread, we talk about what's called the, the r naught or R0 as it's denoted. Um, and this is the reproductive index of the virus or how, how easily it spreads. It's a mathematical calculation, but basically it gives you an idea of uh, the ease of spread. So HIV, for example, has an R0 of 4. Measles has a very high R0 of 18. Um, and this means that because measles is primarily a, an airborne virus, um, 
one person, if no, if no measures are taken, will infect uh, an average of 18 people. Um, and so measles is a very, very contagious disease, and this is why it's important that we all vaccinate ourselves um, and our kids against measles so that we can stop the spread of this super contagious disease. Um, to put into context, um, seasonal influenza, which is a fairly deadly disease that kills approximately 200,000 to 600,000 people across the world each year, um, has an R naught of approximately 1.3, um, and uh, and this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, has an R naught of 2.3. It's been estimated, and initially was estimated all the way up to 3.8, and has varied depending on where the virus is located. But it's now assumed to be about 2.3. Um, so what does that necessarily mean if we think about it? Because it doesn't seem like that much. Well, if you have an R naught that is greater than one, then you're going to have exponential growth. Um, why is that? Because one person who gets infected can can infect two people if no measures are taken. Those each one of those can infect two people, and each one of those two people. So you can see how quickly this becomes an exponential chain of infection, and why this has become such a problem. Um, so we can break these chains through uh, physical distancing and uh, and through the measures that are being taken now. Um, but it is critical that we all act simultaneously um, if we want to really be able to succeed at reducing the R naught. And here's how fragile the R naught is of the virus. Um, Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, was describing the other day that um, there's a very fragile point right now where Germany has an R naught of one, which means that one person is infecting one person, and that if they maintain this, then they won't over uh, overtake the capacity of the German health system. However, if uh, the R naught goes to 1.1, they would overtake this capacity by October, if I'm not mistaken, and if the R naught went up to 1.2, then they would overtake this capacity in August. Um, so it's a very, very fragile uh, level between being in control of the virus and having it quickly skyrocket out of control. So one of the things that makes this virus contagious is the fact that um, it can live on different surfaces for different periods of time. So this is a paper from New England Journal of Medicine where they analyzed um, the virus in different situate on different surfaces, including copper, cardboard, steel, and plastic. And the biggest takeaway is that on certain surfaces like plastic, the virus can remain infectious for about 72 hours. Now, it's, it's important to know or uh, to realize that a virus is not a living thing as per the way we think of, say, bacteria, um, which when it lands on a surface, you know, may tend to grow and multiply. Uh, a virus instead will be degrading, will start degrading as soon as it hits the surface because the virus only comes to life per se once it enters a host cell. So uh, the virus can live on these surfaces for quite some time, on um, plastic up to 72 hours. Um, and so the virus will enter your, your body through the mucous membranes of the face, the eyes, nose, and, and mouth. Um, there are receptors in those cells that can, that can take in the virus. Um, in this paper, they also talked about aerosols from the virus. Now, aerosols are not the primary way that this virus is spread. It's not what's driving this pandemic. It's more a person-to-person -person contact, which is extended contact with somebody at less than two meters uh, distance between people. Um, but in cases where aerosols are formed, say at a dentist's office or in an ICU, intensive care unit, then this can be an issue because it does remain infectious in the air for some time. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the immune response here, um, just to, to bring you in a little bit on that. So there are um, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, which are basically uh, different shapes on, on pathogens that the body will recognize. Um, and generally what happens is you first get, well, it's broken down into an innate immune response, and a specific immune response. And these are the two responses that your body will have. The innate immune response is uh, in place 
you know, in, in the place where uh, the infection happens, it is also immediate and begins working right away. Generally, it's uh, neutrophils that are the type of cells that begin this response. They release granulocytes and other factors to try to, to attack and destroy the, the pathogen. Um, there are different genetic factors in people that affect um, how they're going to respond. Um, but the next step is usually the production of different cytokines, such as IL-6. There are quite a few different types of cytokines, which are proteins that do different activities, generally inflammation-type activities. Um, here's quite a few of the different cytokines that are involved, including interferons um, and which types of cells produce them. And they have different effects on the body. And cytokines are very important in this disease because um, they can cause what's called a cytokine storm, and I'll mention that in a little bit. Um, then you get activation of T cells, um, such as, uh, and, and two types of responses. One is cellular immunity, which is mediated by CD8 killer cells and CD4 helper cells. And then you get humoral immunity, which is antibody responses to the disease. So, this, uh, this virus tends to, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of Spanish there. This virus tends to um, have very varied responses in people. And a lot of this is due to the people's own immune responses. So 81% of patients will have a light disease and they can just stay home and they will be, get better. 14% um, will have severe disease, which will require hospitalization. And 5% of patients will become critical. Um, the virus has a very interesting cycle of infection, which is um, you get infected on day zero and you can take up to 14 days to actually show symptoms. So by day 14, 99% of the people will have shown symptoms who are going to show them. Um, and from this chart, what, what this shows you is that there's one patient who arrives with the disease. This is the first and second patient in the United States. And then you can see this trailing next patient as he starts going through this cycle. And I, I like this chart because it illustrates that this virus definitely has these long and complicated cycles. Um, and now once the virus comes in, there's a very interesting phenomenon that happens, which is that patients who tend to produce more cytokines tend to have worse outcomes with the disease. Um, so you can see clearly here that the ones that have uh, more T lymphocytes fare better, and the ones that produce fewer cytokines seem to fare better, to the point where uh, the patients with the worst outcomes are ones that undergo what's called a cytokine storm, which is a massive release of cytokines that affect, um, that affect the patient's organs in many ways and ultimately lead to organ failure. Um, so notice very interestingly that one of the factors here is the, 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 the presence of T lymphocytes or T cells. So uh, this paper found that there were three main um, types of people. The, you can see in the orange line, those with moderate uh, disease had a certain level of lymphocytes, whereas those with um, more severe disease in the black line had lower lymphocytes. And those that uh, didn't make it past the, the infection had even lower lymphocytes. So it appears that for some reason, uh, lymphocytes are disappearing in the disease in some cases, and that's affecting the severity because people can't fight off the infection. Um, now, why this is happening, we're not quite sure. It may be that the virus infects these cells. Um, and then that affects, uh, that also is affected by antibody production. Um, let me go back, let me go to this slide first. So generally when the virus infects, after, um, after a few days, your body will start fighting with the innate immune response, and then you'll start producing different types of antibody responses, including IgA, IgM, and IgG, which get produced at different times. So IgM is less specific than IgG, and uh, generally, we think that whenever you generate an IgG response, which is around day 15 post-infection, you're going to have a very robust uh, response against the virus, which is very specific. However, in this case, we've noticed that patients who have a higher IgG response tend to have more severe disease, um, which is complicating the way that we think about this virus. 
um, and, and making treatment a little bit more difficult. Um, so we, we still don't know if these antibodies that we're producing are neutralizing antibodies, that is antibodies that can attach to the virus and prevent its entry or its release in cells. Um, they may not be neutralizing, we still don't know. And in the case of non-neutralizing antibodies, that could cause uh, issues that could actually propagate the virus entry into cells. So uh, upon not knowing necessarily, this may uh, be a factor in the production of vaccines in the future, and it's therefore why vaccines require this long production process, which we estimate is going to be somewhere around 12 to 18 months, hopefully, to get a, a vaccine for this virus, because we have to go through this safety process to make sure that something we're going to inject in most people is going to be safe. Um, but sorry, but uh, I, I do believe that we will be getting um, a vaccine at some point in the future with this virus. Uh, it seems that immunity is uh, does occur, even though we're we're seeing some reactivations of virus or some repositive positive people that are coming out positive after having come out negative. Um, this might be due to our testing capacity. It might be due to some sort of latency in the virus life cycle that we didn't know about. Um, but it could also be, um, but, but it does seem to have immunity in some sense. There's been studies in monkeys that have found that immunity is produced um, and that it is somewhat lasting. So I think, uh, I think those questions will be answered at the same speed at which we've been hopefully been getting all this information to date. Um, and thank you very much. I will take any questions uh, when we're when it's time for questions. And I hope that that was uh, an informative uh, introduction to the virus. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miller and Miller. So let's move now to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Meidani is a senior scientist and director of the nutritional <clears throat> immunology team at the Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging. She also served as director of the center from 2009 until she was appointed vice provost for research at Tufts University from 2016-2019. She has a doctor of veterinary medicine from the University of Tehran and her PhD in nutrition from Iowa State University. Dr. Medani's scientific interest include the basic mechanism of aging, impact of nutrition on the aging process, and age-associated disease, role of nutrition on immune and inflammatory responses, and predisposition to infection disease in developed and less developed countries. She is a professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, and a professor of immunology in the Tufts University School of Gra Graduate Biomedical Sciences. So, Simin, the screen should be yours now. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time zone you are in. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction and Elsie for uh, providing me the opportunity to share my thoughts on this very timely topic. Um, nutrition plays an important role in regulating immune and inflammatory responses that are needed to fight against viral and bacterial pathogens. And I hope to demonstrate that to you by using some uh, examples. But let's first um, start by uh, sharing with you a few introductory remarks to set the stage. Um, the uh, figure that is shown in this slide um, depicts a very old, um, not very old, but an old concept, uh, but one that still holds true and uh, I believe is even more important now than it was um, originally proposed um, maybe 50, 60 years ago. Uh, many preclinical and um, clinical studies uh, have um, shown um, that um, deficiency or lower status of essential micro and macronutrients will impair immune response and increase susceptibility to infection. It's also interesting to note that uh, infection, in addition to reducing appetite, uh, which will then re, um, decrease um, overall food intake, 
can compromise a status of some of the nutrients in key organs impacted by the pathogen. Uh, for example, as uh, you can see in um, this uh, slide by, uh, from the work by Hennett et al., um, influenza infection can significantly reduce um, the level of antioxidant nutrients, particularly that of vitamin E, in the lung following infection. Uh, and of interest to today's discussion, uh, bovine diarrhea virus, a member of the coronavirus family, was shown to decrease serum level of vitamin E um, in calves. Now, even though this is a member of the coronavirus fam family, it doesn't mean that the same thing will happen with SARS-CoV-2, although it certainly will be interesting to uh, investigate that. Paying attention to uh, this relationship between nutrition, immunity, and infection in the context of the current pandemic is important because one in three people globally suffer from micronutrient deficiency or what has been recently referred to as hidden hunger. And this is not only observed in less developed countries, rather it exists in segments of population in more developed countries as well. This relationship between nutrition, immunity, and infection is impacted or exacerbated by obesity or overnutrition and aging. 13% of the global population is obese and 8.5% of the global population is over the age of 65. And that number is actually closer to 20% in more developed uh, countries. And it's predicted by, that by the year 2050, globally, this number would um, double by the uh, year 2050. It's important to um, understand the impact of obesity and aging on immune and inflammation, inflammatory responses in the context of nutrition and um, infection. Both aging and obesity result in dysregulation of the immune and inflammatory responses, causing underactivity of the T cell uh, mediated function. And those are the cells that are involved in fighting against uh, viruses and, and bacteria on one hand, uh, and um, increase inflammatory responses on the other hand. Uh, for example, with aging, many aspects of T cell mediated function, including the help that they provide in terms of production of vaccine uh, and also the ability of the cells to proliferate and produce um, uh, significant and important um, cytokines is impaired, making the older population more susceptible to infections and morbidity and mortality from them. On the other hand, um, with aging, there is increase in production of inflammatory uh, cytokines and lipids from different tissues uh, of animals, and, and also uh, this has been observed in humans. Uh, the slides that you can see now uh, shows uh, or compares uh, the ability of macrophages and adipocytes from uh, young and old uh, mice, and as you can see, um, macrophages from old mice ha has produced significantly more level of cytokine IL-6 and IL-1 beta, and also of the lipid prostaglandin E2. Um, on the other hand, uh, in adipose tissue, similarly, you can see that there is higher expression of the gene cyclooxygenase 2, which is a key enzyme in production of PGE2, and higher production of the cytokines IL-1, IL-6, and TNF alpha. And as I mentioned, this is observed in other tissues as well as in um, across the different species. Uh, similarly, as you can see in um, this slide, uh, there is um, 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 obesity is associated with impairment of T cell function, as shown by the ability of the cells to proliferate. And in this slide, you can see that the obese individuals have lower ability to proliferate. Uh, the T cells from obese individuals compared to uh, young uh, in response to different stimuli. And they also, on the other hand, produce higher level of the um, cytokines uh, that are 
that have pro-inflammatory uh, properties. So you can imagine that, at least in part, uh, because of these immune and inflammatory changes, elderly and obese individuals will be more susceptible to infection and morb morbidity and mortality from uh, them, as it has been reported for uh, the current pandemic of COVID-19. Now, how does nutrition uh, affect infection? There are many ways that nutrition can um, change the course of an infection. It can reduce the risk of acquiring infection by uh, influencing pathogen entry. There is some new information about that. Uh, we have a lot of information that nutrition can regulate cell-mediated immune response to pathogens and related to that, the efficacy of vaccines. Um, nutrition can also change morbidity and mortality by regulating oxidative stress and inflammation or excessive inflammation that is produced in response to uh, viral and pathogen infections. There are other ways as well, for example, changing the uh, virulence of pathogens and impacting the gut microbiome, which we're not going to have to focus on um, today. Um, now, I've been asked to uh, focus my uh, remarks on vitamin E and, and zinc, and others will be talking about uh, some of the other uh, nutrients. But uh, before we get into that, I thought it's important to um, um, talk a little bit about the concept that is depicted in this picture. Uh, we know that uh, we have a lot of information from animal studies, human studies, that uh, deficiency of essential nutrients can impair the immune function. And in order to have, um, uh, to maintain um, a good immune function, we need to have adequate level of essential nutrients. What we know much less about is that would we be able to improve even more the immune function um, by going beyond what is the recommended level of the nutrients. Now, we have some evidence that, that um, um, this might be the case in uh, certain circumstances, um, but I have to say that the information that we have uh, related to um, supplementation with higher than uh, recommended level of the nutrients is not as uh, strong as with uh, looking at the relationship between nutritional deficiencies and um, uh, immune uh, function. So uh, there is um, in evidence from several preclinical studies in rodents, pigs, calves, chickens that have shown that vitamin E deficiency impairs immune response and that higher than recommended level may be needed under certain conditions such as older age and stress in order to maintain optimal immune response and resistance to infection. Uh, we also have uh, evidence uh, that this may be the case in uh, humans. As you can see in this uh, slide, studies from our group as well as uh, the laboratories um, through um, double-blind placebo-controlled study have demonstrated that vitamin E supplementation of, for example, healthy older uh, adults significantly improves the in vivo and in vitro indices of T cell mediated function in, um, in elderly. And there's some evidence in uh, younger individual as well. Um, as an example, for example, uh, this is in a study, uh, one of our study in which we supplemented older adults with different uh, level of uh, vitamin E for four months. And then we uh, evaluated their response to uh, hepatitis B vaccine and also uh, looked at a measure of T-cell mediated function called delayed type hypersensitivity skin response. And as you can see, and as would be expected, older adults receiving placebo did not produce much of an antibody response to hepatitis B, but by increasing the level of uh, vitamin E supplementation, we were able to significantly improve their ability to respond to this vaccine, as well as their ability to respond to uh, delayed type hypersensitivity skin response. Uh, what I also like you to notice is that the optimal level was achieved by supplementation with 200 IU of uh, vitamin E. Uh, so the higher level is not necessarily the best uh, level, as I was 
mentioning before. Now, uh, we, uh, there's also evidence from human studies that vitamin E can reduce uh, formation of pro-inflammatory cytokines in human. Um, the data that is shown in this slide is from the study by Van Tietz et al, where they looked at the ex vivo production of cytokines uh, by the blood, uh, white blood cells uh, of uh, normal lipidemic and hyperlipidemic uh, subjects um, in response to different level of um, LPS. And as you can see, um, there was a significant reduction by uh, vitamin E following supplementation um, uh, in production of these pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. And so the vitamin E seems to have the ability to improve T improve T cell mediated function, uh, but also decrease formation of, of inflammatory uh, cytokines. Uh, now, what we also have evidence from uh, animal studies, and, and as I will show you later from some human studies, that these changes that vitamin E can cause in uh, immune and inflammatory responses is reflected in um, higher resistance to uh, infections such as influenza virus. Uh, this is from a study in which um, um, uh, middle-aged uh, mice were fed uh, either adequate level of vitamin E or higher level of uh, vitamin E for um, uh, six months. Uh, and as you can see, um, the animals who were uh, given um, um, vitamin E uh, had significantly lower viral titer following infection with influenza virus. Uh, and, and this was associated with uh, less production of the inflammatory uh, cytokines uh, IL-6 and TNF-alpha. Uh, what I'd like you to notice is that in response to uh, the virus, there is a significant increase in production of these inflammatory cytokine, but vitamin E is able to dampen the production of, of uh, uh, the excessive production of this cytokine. And, and this is associated with less pathology in the lung. And as you can see, with a better clinical outcome. Uh, one of the things that is observed in um, mice following influenza infection is decreasing appetite and uh, loss of weight. As you can see, the control animals uh, lost about seven grams uh, of weight, and they had about six grams uh, per day consumption of um, food following uh, the influenza infection. But uh, the vitamin E fed animals had significantly uh, less weight loss, only two grams, and they continued to consume uh, um, about 17 grams per day of, um, um, of, of uh, their food. So these ch changes that we see in the immune and inflammatory responses are reflected in better outcomes in terms of the infection. Uh, we also observed the same thing with another pathogen, a bacterial pathogen, uh, strep pneumonia, uh, which is a cause, cause of morbidity and mortality among a good uh, percentage of population. So here again, we um, supplemented um, um, young and old animals with either adequate or higher level of vitamin E uh, for a month and then exposed them to the infectious uh, agent. Uh, what you can see here is that, first of all, old animals have, as was expected, had higher uh, lung titer compared to young animals. Uh, when we gave, uh, supplemented the old animals with vitamin E, there was a significant reduction in lung viral titer, uh, not so much in the young animals. Uh, and also there was significantly less virus following vitamin E supplementation in the blood of these uh, animals. Um, if we look at the lungs in terms of the um, production of uh, inflammatory cytokines, you can see that, again, here the old animals have higher level of production of these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines compared to young, both in uh, for uh, TNF-alpha and IL-6. Uh, the animals that are supplemented with vitamin E uh, have significantly less uh, inflammatory response in, in, in response to um, strep pneumonia, uh, and that is reflected in um, much less pathology in the lung of the, uh, these animals uh, compared to the control uh, animals. 
Um, and, and again, here uh, we see that uh, while the uh, uh, control animals lost a significant amount of weight, the um, animals that were supplemented did not lose um, uh, weight. Um, so uh, we were interested to see whether uh, vitamin E can also improve um, resistance to inf respiratory infections in humans and conducted a double-blind placebo-controlled study for a duration of a year. Uh, and we um, supplemented uh, subjects either with uh, a placebo or 200 IU per day of uh, vitamin E and evaluated their respiratory infections. As you can see, uh, um, vitamin E supplementation significantly reduced the risk for all respiratory infection, uh, upper respiratory infections, and uh, common cold, uh, which uh, are uh, often caused by um, members of the coronavi uh, coronavirus family. Um, this is uh, showing more details about the, the impact on colds. You can see that both the percent of subjects uh, with cold uh, was significantly reduced uh, with vitamin E supplementation, as well as the incidence uh, and also the duration of the cold. Um, what is interesting is that uh, while we often think that pneumonias are, are caused uh, by, um, um, by bacteria, uh, there is a lot of evidence now that uh, viral pneumonias are prevalent in uh, among elderly. And as uh, you can see here, uh, when we looked for uh, evidence of antibody titer against uh, several viral infections, uh, we found that a significant number of older uh, people uh, in our study were positive for viral um, uh, infections, including um, human coronavirus OK43, and 229E, and they both com compromised about 17% of, of the uh, tested uh, subjects. Uh, and we could see a significant association between pneumonias and acute bronchitis and, and um, acute lower, lower respiratory infections and these viral infections. So just to summarize what I've um, uh, discussed so far about vitamin E, uh, vitamin E seems uh, to, at least in older population, um, uh, improve uh, the T cell mediated function and also control uh, excessive inf inflammation that is caused by um, uh, infections such as influenza and the strep uh, pneumonia. We also have evidence that uh, it uh, may uh, protect older subjects, at least, um, against uh, respiratory infections. Um, uh, and uh, there's also a lot of evidence that if you have deficiency of vitamin E, you can impair your immune response and resistance to infections. So the other nutrients that I was asked to, to talk about is, is uh, zinc. Um, and, and similar to vitamin E, there is a lot of evidence both from animal studies and human studies that have been conducted actually mostly in less developed countries. Zinc deficiency can impair many aspects of, of um, uh, the immune uh, response. Um, and um, uh, there has been, and, and also the, um, the uh, ability of an individual to fight against infections. Uh, and because zinc deficiency is prevalent in parts of the, the world, and as you can see also in, in um, more developed uh, countries, there has been a lot of interest to look at the relationship between uh, zinc deficiency and, um, and um, um, different types of infections. Now, according to uh, NHANES three study, uh, three groups of, of uh, population in U.S. are at risk for zinc deficiency. That includes children between the age of one to three, adolescent females, and elderly people. Um, so many studies have been conducted in children to look at relationship between zinc and, and pneumonia, and uh, that they have been summarized in uh, meta-analysis by uh, Zik, who found that, that uh, zinc supplementation 
in, in children did decrease incidence of pneumonia, and that was uh, then uh, confirmed in more recent uh, studies. Now, um, while we might think that zinc deficiency is not observed in, in uh, more developed countries, uh, as I mentioned before, we have evidence that indeed it, did, it does exist. For example, in uh, nursing home populations, as well as independently living elderly, we have observed that 30% of nursing home um, residents have lower serum zinc levels, and 22% of independently living elderly have lower uh, zinc level. Um, interestingly, what we observed was that, that the subjects who have low serum zinc level have significantly higher incidence of uh, pneumonia compared to those who have adequate level of zinc. They also had a longer duration of pneumonia uh, and more antibiotic prescription and more duration of antibiotic uh, consumption. Um, this uh, does not, uh, what needs to be determined though is that would supplementation uh, with zinc of subjects who are low in zinc is, uh, reduce the risk for acquiring pneumonia, and that is a study that needs to be done. But there was a smaller study um, conducted by Dr. Parsat, uh, who supplemented older people for a year with 45 milligram per day of zinc, uh, and showed that there was a significant reduction in all infection and a tendency for decrease in common cold um, and and upper respiratory infection, but the number of subjects was too small to really see a significant um, effect. They were also able to show that zinc supplementation reduced oxidative stress in these uh, subjects. So uh, we were also sh uh, able to show uh, in a um, study with, with a small number of subjects and duration of three months that supplementation with 30 milligram per day of zinc of uh, older subjects who are low in zinc can significantly improve in their uh, improve their T cell mediated function. But as I mentioned, we need larger clinical trial to demonstrate that if indeed uh, supplementing um, zinc deficient subjects with zinc would improve their resistance to pneumonia, which would certainly be an important finding uh, if that would be the case. Now, there's a lot of interest in zinc and common cold, um, and there have been many studies conducted, and they were, uh, they were summarized in a meta-analysis that was conducted in 2012. And as you can see from this meta-analysis, and it's broken down into adults and in children, and then overall, you can see the most effect seems to be observed in adults, uh, some effect in children, and then overall there is a significant reduction in terms of the duration of the symptom, not necessarily the, uh, the incidence, but the duration of the symptoms. Uh, similarly, um, uh, it was uh, interesting to note that there was some difference in terms of the effectiveness by the type of zinc that was consumed, and zinc acetate seemed to be uh, most effective, but zinc gluconic was, was also um, uh, effective. Um, related to COVID-19, it's interesting to, to note that recent studies have, have shown that zinc can uh, inhibit coronavirus and arterivirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a an, uh, key enzyme in terms of replication uh, of the, uh, of the, 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 uh, the virus, uh, and um, that in in vitro cultures, uh, zinc and zinc ionophores were able to inhibit uh, proliferation of the SARS-CoV virus. This had not been demonstrated with mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19 and needs to be uh, um, demonstrated bef before we can draw any conclusion related to zinc and ability to inhibit proliferation of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So, to conclude, uh, um, I th hope that I've been able to demonstrate <clears throat> to you that um, nutrition is an important factor in regulating immune and inflammatory responses. Uh, and I know that you will be interested to know whether 
this relationship holds for the current uh, pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, I have to start by saying that, that at the moment, we don't have any direct evidence that any uh, nutrition supplementation can improve resistance to COVID-19. Uh, however, we can speculate that there is potential for nutrition in, intervention um, uh, and, and uh, form hypothesis that certainly is um, uh, very much worth uh, testing to see if, in fact, uh, supplementation with particular uh, nutrients or mixture of nutrients can improve the progression or change the course of, of this very devastating uh, disease. And, and in this picture, I have um, uh, pointed out to areas where uh, nutrition has the potential for intervention. Again, I want to emphasize that we don't have any direct evidence, uh, but it can certainly impact um, viral entry and, and um, uh, viral uh, proliferation. There is some new uh, evidence that has been emerging related to that. Uh, it can um, uh, certainly impact specific immunity to the, to the virus. Again, that needs to be demonstrated. And it has the potential to uh, reduce uh, and dampen the uh, inflammatory response, which is uh, responsible for the um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is often the cause of morbidity and mortality in uh, patients with COVID-19. Um, but I think um, the evidence suggests that it's certainly worth um, testing the hypothesis that uh, whether nutrition supplementation can improve uh, the course of uh, this um, disease. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening, and I will be uh, happy to answer questions during the discussion period. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, we've received a lot of uh, comments on the chat box uh, thanking you for uh, your presentation. Um, they say very clear, uh, very did didactic, so this is great. I mentioned at the beginning of the um, of the event that we have received already a question before uh, through your registration system and uh, we have shared those questions on Sunday night with the speaker so they could address some of them uh, during the during their presentation so maybe <clears throat> sorry let's start with uh, maybe a question to you uh, professor Simin um, we have the question or do nu the nutrition impact of, on the immune system varies across the lifespan, and is there a time when nutrition plays a bigger role? Um, yes, of course, I, I think um, the uh, nutrition is important across all the different stages of, uh, uh, of life, but um, there are certain um, uh, stages of life, for example, during older age and uh, during infancy that nutrition becomes even more important because of, in case of the uh, infants and children, um, uh, the fact that their immune system is not fully uh, developed, and in case of older population, because uh, they have a, a decline in uh, their cell-mediated immune response, and they have this low-grade inflammation, which is referred to as inflamed aging. Uh, and some of this has been um, uh, connected and related to uh, the fact that the older people are at risk for consumption of several micronutrients, including, uh, for example, vitamin E, vitamin C, B6, and, and, and folate, and, and vitamin D. And, and so during uh, these uh, stages of life, uh, nutrition becomes even more important. But regardless, um, um, across all different stages of, of life, uh, it is important to make sure that you have uh, adequate uh, nutrition. And this is why it's worrisome with the current pandemic, because uh, uh, there are large areas of the world that suffer from uh, different nutritional deficiencies. And, and this could help in terms of making this, this pandemic even more devastating than it currently is. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for you, Dr. Marin Miller, we got a lot of questions regarding the specifics uh, of the virus, uh, and people are asking what factors cause the COVID-19 mutation. Do you have any answer for that? There we go. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so all, all viruses uh, will mutate, and RNA viruses tend to mutate more often. So generally, when you have uh, an RNA virus, what actually happens is when you get infected, the, the virus as it replicates is already mutating, um, generally at a rapid pace. And so what you end up having is what's called a viral quasi-species, which you can imagine to be sort of a cloud of viruses that are all just a little bit different from each other. And so generally you get this, this viral uh, infection that is more like a cloud of different viruses. With this virus, the mutation rate seems to be quite a bit slower because the virus has certain proteins that help it to, to sort of proofread um, its, its errors as it replicates. Um, and so this, is, this virus is expected to mutate at around a rate of 25 mutations a year, which if you think about influenza virus, that probably mutates around 50 times a year. Um, so it's a pretty slow mutation rate, especially for RNA viruses. And one thing that's important to, to remember here is that generally when a virus mutates, the mutations tend to be inert. They tend to not have any effect. Uh, positive or negative on the virus, and generally, if they do have an effect, it tends to be at attenuating the virus and making it less virulent. Um, but of course, uh, mutations that can make the virus more virulent do occur, although I believe they're a lot less common. Um, and having different mutations and different strains of the virus doesn't necessarily mean that one is deadlier than the other or that it can be uh, more contagious than the other. It may just mean that given different selection pressures, like different quarantines in different places and how, how strictly certain populations adhere to those measures, um, ends up selecting certain strains of the virus to become more prevalent than others. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Midan, <clears throat> sorry Midan, um, is there any specific diet for COVID-19 patients, like diabetics diet for diabetic patients, low salt diet for hypertension patients? What's your uh, view? Not, yeah, not at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, um, uh, disease is so new that there hasn't really been time to test the effectiveness of any particular dietary pattern or any particular uh, nutrients on uh, the resistance to disease. But in general, I think if we would want to improve um, or, or make sure that the immune system is functioning well and that there's not un uncontrolled inflammation um, that could be uh, damaging, um, you would want to be consuming uh, adequate level of all the nutrients, which means that, um, you know, this is an old advice, but uh, still true that you have to make sure uh, you do consume adequate level of fruits and vegetables because they are very enriched in micronutrients and in antioxidant uh, nutrients with anti-inflammatory properties and, and the micronutrients that can make sure that the cell-mediated immune response is, is functioning well. So, um, um, as I said, it would be very nice if we could say at the moment that there was a particular diet for COVID-19, but there is not. But I think it will be certainly an area that uh, we are going to see a lot of investigation being uh, conducted, hopefully, going forward. Yeah, thank you. And are you aware, Dr. Medani, uh, whether there's any tri controlled trial giving vitamin D, C, or zinc to treat uh, COVID-19 patients? And if so, uh, do you have any idea on the results? Um, well, there is no result, but I know that there are very few studies that, that are ongoing. Um, mm -hmm. there, is, there are some studies with uh, zinc and vitamin C and um, uh, with um, a combination of uh, perhaps zinc and vitamin D in combination with some of the antiviral uh, drugs and, and hydroxychloroquine. Um, the studies have just started. I understand that there is a study with quercetin, um, but uh, we don't have any results from in, any of them. And I have to say that some, the design of some of the studies are, are not very good. They are either small or don't have control. But um, those are the only studies that when I searched the um, clinicaltrial.gov, I could, uh, could see that, that are ongoing. 
Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> for you, Dr. Marin Miller, uh, we spoke at the beginning of, of this event, you know, about maybe addressing myth and, uh, and fake news. And it seems on social media, there's uh, advice uh, that if you take some uh, sodium bicarbonate, uh, it's good because it maintains your body alkaline and helps your immune system. What your thought on that? Yeah, I don't think there's any real basis in this. Your your body regulates its pH, um, and so what, what you eat doesn't affect the rest of the pH in your body. If it did, it would change the acidity of your blood, and, and that would have huge consequences on your on your health. So this is this is a baseless uh, thing that that is uh, false information for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe for you, uh, Dr. Maidani, um, how strong is the evidence? I mean, you, you touched on it during the presentation, but how strong is the evidence that obesity increases the risk of death uh, from coronavirus 19? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of the, the question. How strong, is, how strong is the evidence that obesity increases the risk of death from coronavirus 19? So, I think evidence is emerging that obesity increases the risk for current, uh, for COVID-19, certainly for people with BMI of more than 40, uh, they are at great risk. CDC has ad identified that group as, as uh, being at, at a, a very high risk for, for morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. And there's also evidence from other parts of the world that obesity can increase your risk. Obesity is often also associated with uh, conditions, for example, heart disease, hypertension, that have and diabetes, which is linked to the increased risk for uh, COVID-19 and evidence from other infections, for example, influ influenza, um, uh, indicates that obesity can risk uh, can increase the risk for uh, susceptibility to influenza and also morbidity and mortality from from it. So, and we also know from mechanistically that obesity can impair T cell mediated function and is associated with higher inflammation. So, certainly keeping um, um, weight at a normal level uh, would be very helpful in terms of um, <coughs> reducing risk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Marin Miller, we have the question online uh, from today that in the Philippines, the Department of Health claims that misting an aerosolized material can disperse the virus. So is, is that true? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't heard about that. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that I can make a determination. Um, I, I don't know about ionization, whether it affects or not the virus. Definitely the virus um, can be affected by a lot of factors, um, electrostatic energy, for example or electrostatic electro, uh, uh, interference. For instance, in uh, masks, when they get produced, the N95 masks, they, they bring with them um, an electrostatic charge, and that helps to prevent the virus from penetrating the fibers. Um, but I really can't say for, for ionization if it, if it has any effect. I haven't read anything to that effect. Okay, and <clears throat> still to you, uh, regarding the r naught you mentioned earlier, uh, how do you explain such big differences uh, in country when the average is 2.3 uh, and while in Germany it's only one? So how would you explain this big difference? Well, I, th I think that the difference in Germany is that they've taken measures to be able to reduce the r naught. right? If you, the r naught is a number that is measured if you do not take any measures, but you can influence the reproduction number of the virus by taking measures such as uh, physical distancing, quarantine, um, and maintaining good hygiene. So that, that's exactly what we want to be able to do is to, through our actions, influence the rate at which the virus can spread. And so far, what we understand is the most effective measures are social distancing or physical distancing, actually, um, because that's exactly how the virus is spread, right? Through person-to-person -person contact at less than, than two meters of spread. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Dr. Medani, I think this is interesting. Um, so we have this question which says, since inflammatory cytokines are released from adipose, is it possible that people such as bodybuilder who try to achieve extremely low body fat be at risk 
for insufficient innate response? Um, I I don't think so because um, the the reason um, I don't believe that that um, um, that 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 would be the the case. Um, the adipose uh, tissue uh, of uh, the reason, for example, what I showed you was from older subjects. They, I mean, older um, older animals. Uh, they have migration of um, many of the inflammatory macrophages into the adipose uh, tissue, um, and and also the adipocytes themselves can uh, are are making higher level of um, of uh, these these cytokines. Uh, so people who have normal mm -hmm. weight, um, and and I don't believe that the bodybuilders reduce their fat to the level that would prevent them from um, you know other sort of normal bodily function besides the cytokines are produced by uh, mainly by the cells of the immune uh, system that are in the circulation as well as in uh, many of the other tissues of, of the body so I don't believe that they are going to be impairing their ability to respond to a pathogen um, it is true that if you do a stressful exercise, um, following this stressful exercise, uh, there is a suppression of the immune system, but bodybuilders do that over time, and it's not sort of one bulk of very uh, stressful exercise that they are conducting. Okay, and <clears throat> another question for you. Um, would you expect a combination of nutrients to be more effective? given that there are multiple mechanisms involved uh, for nutrition to positively impact immunity? So I have to qualify my answer by saying that I don't have any direct evidence that would say combination of nutrients is better than single nutrients, and that's in fact something that needs to be tested. But given that there are different uh, mechanisms involved, um, and, and although I'm used to conducting you know, uh, single nutrient intervention rather than than combination. But I think in this case, um, it might be useful to look into certain complementary um, mixture of of nutrients that might be helpful. But again, that's something that we need to test um, uh, in in a well controlled study. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Marine Muller. Um, uh, we have this question regarding. Uh, the contamination in Italy of the air and whether you think there could be a relationship between uh, the spread of the virus and the air pollution? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons why the virus can spread in different countries differently. There's, of course, we know this virus has higher risk in certain people with certain pre-existing conditions um, and primarily in older people. So Italy has a very high percentage I think it's around 25% of people above the age of 60 uh, in their population. And so factors like these are going to have uh, a major uh, impact. Um, I don't think we can say that the virus evolution itself yet has, has been determined to be an impact, um, although it is, it is possible. Um, but I, I would think that more likely it's other factors, um, including the accessibility to, to the best health care, um, the ability of hospitals to respond, um, you know, not given as much time as other places had to prepare, um, everything from the social response to the virus, how well people responded and tried to stay home and stay distanced. Um, all of these factors, including the addition of these other comorbidities and age, play a, a big role in, in how it's spread differently in different countries. Okay. And what is your take on the potential association of the blood group and risk of coronavirus 19, COVID-19? Yes, there was a, a very interesting study that came out um, where they analyzed different, uh, different types of blood groups and their association to the virus, both to infectivity and severity of the disease. And they found that people with blood group A uh, had more chance of severe infection and were more likely to get infected than uh, people with blood group O. Um, although they didn't make any assessments as to why that might be, 
but um, and it also doesn't mean that people with blood group O are immune. But it does. It may mean that um, people with blood group A need to take additional precautions. However, I think that because anybody can be a carrier to this virus, um, it just means that we all need to take great precautions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Midani. Uh, again, we read uh, on social media or, or uh, website, you know, that some an herbal or ginger or turmeric could help immunity during the pandemic. So what is your take on that? Um, so I think that, um, again, I hate, hate to repeat the same thing, but at the moment we don't really have any strong evidence that, that um, ginger or um, turmeric may be beneficial. Uh, the reason people might think that they are uh, could be beneficial is that they both have strong anti-inflammatory effect. Um, however, I will be very cautious about taking large amounts of um, any of these compounds because um, depending on the stage of the disease, uh, you could be suppressing uh, the the T cell mediated function if you took large amounts of of some of these um, food compounds. But so um, I think at the moment um, everyone needs to proceed with caution in terms of um, taking any type of uh, uh, supplements without really um, looking very carefully into the strength of the evidence and where it is that they. The evidence has has uh, come from. Okay, thank you. And now a question for both of you: um, How would you determine uh, what is an optimal inflammatory response to help fight the infection versus the potentially damaging cytokine storm? So we want to start. Well, I think, <laughs> maybe I'll start. I think I think it's a complicated balance, of course. Um, you know, and this is why it, it, very quickly a patient can go from having a, a, a moderate a response to suddenly having a very critical response. Um, it's, a, it's a very hard balance to maintain. And uh, from what I've read, there's been now several studies that are trying to measure uh, different ways of targeting um, cytokines and blocking cytokine activity to see if we can modulate and perhaps uh, you know, provide some more support for patients who are are having this hyperactive immune responses. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't really have much to add to that. It is very difficult. I think one of the things that we are finding with some of the nutritional intervention, um, for, for example, with vitamin E or with quercetin is that they do have the ability to control uh, the heightened inflammatory response in response to some of the other infections, for example, influenza with uh, positive outcomes, but we really don't know um, uh, much at all about what the impact will be in terms of controlling the cytokine storm that is caused by COVID-19. Okay, thank you. And following with you, uh, Dr. Medani, uh, accumulating reports show that a person with comorbidities, especially diabetics, have increased risk of severe case of COVID-19 infection and perhaps death. Will this be connected to certain deficiencies of nutrient and can be modulated with the combined vitamin and mineral uh, supplements such as vitamin D, E, and C, perhaps zinc? Um, there's some evidence that um, people who have diabetes might have um, lower status of some of the antioxidant uh, nutrients, and that really has to do with uh, the fact that di uh, diabetes is often um, associated with uh, obesity, and with obesity, there is higher uh, level of oxidative stress and, and inflammation. Um, and there's some evidence that uh, supplementation with some of the antioxidant nutrients and um, and um, some of the um, spices and herbs that have anti-inflammatory effect has been um, um, beneficial um, in, in terms of people with diabetes and the outcome. Um, but um, there's, I'm not aware of any specific uh, deficiency 
um, per se. There is compromise of status, but uh, but not over deficiency of uh, any of the nutrients that that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> and Dr. Amain Mila, uh, what would what would be the the specific that makes um, such viruses coming from animals to human? How how does it disseminate somehow? How does it reach to human? Well, you know, uh, I made the point uh, earlier that uh, bats, for example, are a good reservoir for viruses. This is because uh, bat, the, the immune response in bats uh, allows for a sort of uh, symbiosis there in which the virus can live uh, you know, more, more calmly and, and without causing disease in the animal. Um, since humans are encroaching now with global warming and uh, moving into areas that normally we weren't in, we're coming more into contact with these animals and particularly through some of these practices as uh, having them in wet markets um, and, other, and other situations like this, it's becoming more likely that we're interacting with animals. But it's not just wild animals. We also, uh, a lot of these viruses jump from our own livestock. Um, and it's because of these practices of having the animals um, in, in conditions that are not their normal natural habitats. Um, and so we're, we're propagating the, the possibilities of these viruses jumping from species into human beings. Um, and I think we're going to keep seeing more of this as, as we've always seen with uh, quite a few different viruses. Um, and as we continue this process, we're going to end up seeing that more. Okay, thank you very much. And so maybe now the last question for both of you, uh, maybe I think uh, to end this, this event, what actions can be pursued to increase the number and quality of research in this area? So what's your view? Um, I, I think we need to um, certainly um, encourage our, our, uh, the founders to, to support um, well-controlled con uh, studies that that um, uh, and quickly to test uh, some of the possibilities and um, strategies that uh, several of the scientists around the, the world and, and uh, in US are working on to try to see if we can find um, an effective strategy. Uh, and of course, as a nutritionist, I would want to really encourage um, support of uh, studies uh, that uh, do look into effectiveness of, of um, nutrition intervention against the progression of, of the, the virus for two reasons. One, that there is a possibility that it could be effective and it's a very uh, safe and, and, um, and uh, economically feasible uh, intervention, but uh, and also to sort of really um, address some of the myths and misuse of uh, the supplements that currently is being uh, encouraged um, all over the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Miller? Well, I think the only thing I can add to that is that I, I think we should take advantage of this new situation that we're all in now, where we're all sort of forced to have this teleworking. Um, and I think instead of thinking about it as a negative thing, we could think about it in the, the positive way that uh, physical presence is no longer a barrier to being able to have collaborations and scientific discussions. Uh, it's exactly the same for me to be connected to somebody in Europe as it is uh, in any of uh, these other countries that we're in. Um, and so I think that, that as scientists, we should take advantage of this opportunity and really try to have collaborations with interdisciplinary teams that can help us be more creative and find adequate and proper solutions with the right people behind us um, to support the areas that we are not experts in so that we can find good solutions and innovate against this virus. Okay, well, I, I want to thank you both of you very much on behalf of ILSI. Um, I, I want to thank also Dr. Anya Leon, uh, Executive Director for Mesoamerica, who really helped me uh, with uh, preparing this event. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, next week we have another uh, and, and second uh, part of, of this series of webinar we are organizing. Uh, if you look uh, to ilc.org, you'll get to the hero of the event. You just click on it 
and it will take you to the registration page. So again, uh, Dr. Medani, Dr. Marin Miller, I thank you very much for your time, for sharing your knowledge, and I uh, wish everyone a good day or a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.